So the community rights movement basically is a, is a movement of people who are sick and tired of waiting for our government at any level to protect our health and welfare, to protect environmental quality, recognizing that corporations have basically become the primary yeah. dominant institutions yes. of our time. They're overpowering yes. government. They've overpowered us. And so, you know, the response has to be we the people understanding that we have and can exercise our authority to govern ourselves. And they're doing it. 150 communities in nine states. Hi, welcome to Peak Moment. I'm Jenea Donaldson. My guest today is Paul Cienfuegos, who's an educator, an organizer, and a regional leader in the community rights movement, which I think is one of the most exciting things to emerge on our horizon for a long time. So let's start. What is, thank you for joining me. And what? I think it's the most exciting movement as well. Wow, I mean, time. it gives me some hope yeah. that we can, we can turn on some ugliness here. What is? Community Rights Movement. The community Rights Movement was launched about 13 years ago in a small rural Pennsylvania community of Wells Township. It's a mostly Republican farm community and uh, 500 farmers or so in this hog farm community. And they were sick and tired of trying to figure out how to stop this 15,000 head factory farm of hogs from moving into their town, to their family farm community and they'd spent three years trying to figure it out, and all they could get from the state government in Pennsylvania was, um, talk to us about manure management, not about, we don't want a factory farm of 15,000 hogs in our community. And they'd been working with a group called the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund for those couple years, battling this hog farm proposal through the regulatory system, mm -hmm. which is what they thought was the only system that was out there. But right from the start, they were somewhat stunned that that was all there was because they were patriotic citizens who had been taught in civics that we the people are the sovereign, that we have self-governing authority. Yeah, yeah. So from the beginning, they just assumed that there would be some organization somewhere in the state government in Pennsylvania where if virtually the entire town said, we don't want it, it wouldn't come. And it turned out that wasn't true at all. Um, and, it never, and that it really never has been that way in the United States. It's been really a giant myth. Um, and so, they ended up saying to the lawyers at the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, who up until that point had only done environmental regulatory law themselves, why can't we just pass a law that says no corporate agriculture, no factory farms in our community? And the Seldov attorney said, well, because it's illegal. And they're stunned. It's like, well, what do you mean it's illegal? So the Seldov attorneys explained to them that um, to say no, to, to, to ban a factory farm from coming into their community, would violate the corporation's constitutional rights, a whole variety of them, would violate something called state preemption, which is the state government claiming that anything, any industrial or commercial activity which the state considers normal and legal cannot be banned at the local level. The state preempts a local community from banning what is normal. And factory farms are normal. And clear cutting is normal and GMO agriculture is normal, oh God, right? All these and moving all of our factories overseas to sweatshops is normal. So anything that's normal, a local community can't ban, it's called state preemption. And then the flip side of state preemption is called Dillon's rule. He was in D-I-L-L-O-N apostrophe S. He was a an 1800, late 1800s judge who's, who basically also decided that you you can't allow a local municipal government from making laws about things that the state doesn't want them to make laws about. So the local community ends up with just zoning, regulatory, nuisance authority, a couple other things that are very insignificant. So you get elected thinking that you're getting elected to protect the health and welfare of your community. But basically what you find out very quickly and what most Americans don't realize is that the, even the elected officials in a local government have virtually no authority mm -hmm because the relationship between state and local under law is like parent to child. Mm, mm, and mm. the parent tells the child what it's allowed to do and what it's and not so allowed to do. And their hands are just tied. So as an elected official, you really can't do much of anything. So 
the, the township supervisors of this tiny little conservative farm community, Wells Township, they didn't really care whether they were going to break the law or not. They were trying to stop this thing. So they said to the attorneys at this public interest law firm, write us a law that, that says this is illegal in our town and we will pass it. And the Seldiv attorney said, okay. So they, they wrote, they drafted a law called the Anti-Corporate Farming Ordinance, which was very simple and direct. It banned non-family owned corporations from engaging in farming or owning farmland. And it passed unanimously by the township supervisors. And lo and behold, the giant ag corporation moved somewhere else. And they were about to get their permit after a couple of years of a fight. It worked. It worked. Whew. Right? The local community did something which is illegal. It was a direct challenge to yeah. corporate rights, state preemption, Dillon's rule. And the company still left. So other communities very rapidly heard about this around Wells Township, and they passed the same thing. And within a few years, 20 rural conservative farm communities had passed the anti-corporate farming ordinance. And it just kind of took off from there. That's where it started about 13 years ago. Um, within a few more years, 80 communities in rural Pennsylvania had banned corporations from dumping urban sewage sludge in their farms, on their farmland. There were a couple of communities in rural Maine that were trying to stop Nestle Corporation and its Poland Springs brand from putting a bottling plant in their two rural towns. Mm -hmm. um, they heard about what was happening in Pennsylvania. They asked this public interest law firm to write a law that bans corporations engaging in water withdrawal for bottling. They passed it in their two communities and, and, they, and, and Nestle left in both communities and they'd already set up a fair amount of expensive infrastructure, you know, and was in place, and they left. So have, have these been challenged? You bet. Legally? You bet. But, su but surprisingly less than you might think. But let me just tell you a little yeah, bit more ahead. of the story. Um, ultimately, within a handful of years, what happened is that communities started to realize, wow, if we have the right to self-govern around what we're trying to stop, that's not actually really what we need. What we need is to figure out what we want, not what we don't want. Mm -hmm. And so there was a profound but subtle, I should say a subtle but profound shift that happened in a bunch of communities. And they started to um, imagine themselves as defining what they want, defining their okay. rights, okay. Okay. rather than simply banning Just things. Just fighting things, yes. Okay. yes. And so for example, about three or four years ago, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania joins this battle um, in the first um, major city to do this. Okay. Pittsburgh, by a seven to zero city council vote, um, ban passes a right to water ordinance, recognizing they're trying to stop fracking okay. within okay. the city. And believe it or not, there were a few hundred fracking contracts being in the process of negotiated in the city of Pittsburgh. And so they felt they were under great pressure mm -hmm. to protect mm -hmm. their water. Mm -hmm. And so they, they understood the nature of this new paradigm of lawmaking. They'd been talking to the Seldiff attorneys, and so they passed a right to water which requires that fracking be banned to protect everyone's right to water. Right, so, so that it's about became, rights. it's about rights. And so this has just been taking off and expanding and becoming really much more, more and more, more and more of an elegant, um, kind of landscape or, 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 or approach. So I think one of the things that's excited me the most in this, in this latest approach is, has happened in rural conservative New Hampshire, where they still have their annual town meeting as their primary form of government, where everybody literally raises mm -hmm. their hand one day a year for a whole series of agenda items that everybody's been pre-educated you know, educated are going to be on right. the agenda that day. And um, what happened in, uh, after a couple of years of organizing in New Hampshire, where they'd been trying to get the governor to say no to this enormous electricity transmission line coming from Quebec called Northern Pass. And the governor was gung-ho, it's like jobs, jobs, jobs. You know, what we hear from both of our, you know, corporate parties these days. And what happened was that Seldiff's organizers were in New Hampshire and they said, you know, how about if you, you know, you have the right and authority as a self-governing people in these communities in New Hampshire to pass an ordinance which is which ended up being framed as the right of a to the right to a sustainable energy future. 
That's actually part of the name of the ordinance the right to a sustainable energy future. And so the next question is, well, what is sustainable energy? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so what they did in the ordinance, and it's, it's really quite an amazing ordinance, is they, they create a legal definition in the local law for unsustainable energy, and then they ban anything that meets that definition. Oh, okay, come from the backside, yeah, the right? other side. Which yes. is a really elegant solution. Brilliant. Brilliant. And four small conservative New Hampshire communities have now passed these in the hundreds to thousands range in population. Sugar Hill, New Hampshire, a couple hundred people there, passed it 175 to zero. I mean, this is people raising their hands. This is all very yeah, public. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yes. the movement, so the community rights movement basically is a, is a movement of people who are sick and tired of waiting for our government at any level to protect our health and welfare, to protect environmental quality, recognizing that corporations have basically become the primary yeah. dominant institutions yes. of our time. They're overpowering yes. government. They've overpowered us. And so, you know, the response has to be we the people understanding that we have and can exercise our authority to govern ourselves and they're doing it 150 communities in nine states this is that's why it's the most exciting thing we're fighting fighting the big the big boys thank you let's look for a part two okay i'm with paul cienfuegos who's a community organizer and educator about community rights you're talking this is Jenea donaldson peak moment tv join us for part two